The main theme of our gathering is nostalgia. I am an author of non-fiction and I am a student of the Polish writer Hannah Kral, who is a journalist and leading chronicler of the Holocaust. When, at the age of 20, I first started to write, Hannah Kral often used to tell me that all the words in existence have already been used. They are all worn out. And then that as I write, I should always be aware of that fact. I have now, now written several books, short ones, each no more than 120 pages long. One of them is about the women in Bosnia and Herzegovina who stand over open mass graves watching the specialists do their work, the forensic anthropologists who extract human bones from deep pits and try to reassemble them like doing a jigsaw puzzle to form complete skeletons. These women are waiting for the bodies of their murdered men, fathers, husbands, brothers and sons. For years, with the help of DNA tests, the remains of men who perished in the war of 1992 to 1995 have been identified and returned to their women, who can then give them a decent burial. In other words, give them a proper funeral, the way it meant to be according to local custom and religion. That's what these women want. That's what gives them the strength to go on living. For how long can you go on yearning for a man you know will never be coming back? Asks a war widow in my book. She doesn't want to go on yearning. Yearning for the dead is destroying her, her poisoning her life. And she has children. She wants to go on living because she has no choice. She doesn't want any nostalgia. She's doing her best to push nostalgia for everything she has lost as far away from her as possible. I don't write about nostalgia ever. It doesn't interest me. Nostalgia seems to me a trivial, vapid, unimportant emotion but it must be a good one if it gets talked about the literary gatherings. <laughs> we may feel nostalgia for a better, more peaceful world, but did such a world ever really exist? Everyone always think that the last war is the last one that will ever happen. But it never is. There has always been a Rwanda, and there always will be. Here we are, spending money on nostalgia, on digressions about literary form, researching nostalgia, discussing nostalgia, the literature of nostalgia. All these are nice occupation for safe and rich people. I wrote a book about Rwanda too, about how these days, in that small country, the victims and executioners have to live alongside each other. The book was first published by Poles, recently by French, and the Italians are going to publish it any day now, but not the British. According to the publisher here, my story is too strong, too difficult for British readers. I am not saying this to complain. Maybe my book just isn't good enough, but to express my perplexity at your wish to talk about nostalgia. And here I am, taking part in this discussion, while over there, in Rwanda, in the small place called Murambi, there is a woman for, who, for years on end, has, had spent every single day standing in the same spot holding a bunch of keys. As we sit here talking about nostalgia at the literary gathering, I can see that woman before my eyes. 
Ladies and gentlemen, allow me briefly to focus your attention on her. Her name is Juliette. Every day she waits outside of the main, main building of the school that never actually worked as a school because in April 1994, when it had only just been built, it became the site of the massacre of tens of thousands of people. After that, the school was never opened, but the buildings are still there. Near the gate, in the front of the office block, stands Juliet. Every day, four years, as still as a statue. She's waiting. Every day, four years, she's been waiting. She's not much older than 40, and she's holding that bunch of keys. It was a first day, the 7th of April, that Tutsi had gathered here from the surrounding hills. Juliet had come with her husband and three children. The youngest child was a tiny baby, so she was carrying it on the, her back in the shawl. 50,000 Tutsi had gathered on the school grounds. The classrooms are brick barracks scattered over 10 hectares. The school was surrounded. The water and electricity were cut off so the people trapped inside would weaken. Any of them who didn't know how to get water for themselves or at least some raw sweet potato died after just a few days. The corpses were left lying among those who were still alive. A week went by, then another. The crowd were stinking and uh, had no strength left at all, at all. Juliet took all three of her children and went up to the soldiers. Listen, she said, I am not a Tutsi, I am a Hutu. She showed them her identity card, clearly stamped Hutu. What are you doing here? They asked in surprise. I followed my husband here, she said. He is a Tutsi, but we've decided we can't manage without water any longer. He's going to stay here, and I'm taking the children home. The Hutu soldiers didn't give it, in, it a second thought. No problem, they said. She was pleased. No problem, you can go. But if you are real Hutu, you'll go home alone and leave the children here. In Rwanda, identity as a Hutu or a Tutsi is inherited from the father, and no one ever argues about it. Juliette didn't argue ever. She took the children and went back to her husband in the middle of the crowd. Then they started shooting. Juliette, her husband, and the children ran into the office block to hide. When the Hutu came up to the door, she ran out to them crying, I am a Hutu. All right, they said, get out of here. She tried to go back into the office for her family, but by now there was nothing to go back for. Now, Juliet is one of seven survivors from Murambi. Another one is a child she was carrying on her back at that time. The older two and her husband are now lying here under the concrete along with 50,000 others. Or they may be lying somewhere else. If nostalgia, nostalgia were to prompt you to go and see her there, Juliette would take you behind the office block where there are some barracks, 40 meters long and 5 meters wide, designed to be classrooms. Each one has a locked metal door. You can hear the keys jangle as Juliet, Juliet opens the first one. There are no school desks in these classrooms, just wooden banks, racks made of raw planks knit together. On them, there are people, intact. 
they haven't decomposed because they've been desiccated. Their, is, their skin is unbroken. It's a silent composition of, of figures, sculptures, stinking monuments. Frozen solids, they lie packed close together. Most are bald, but some have black hair. They are in various poses, holding their hand, heads, shielding their eyes or ears, curling their knees up to their chins. Some are in t-shirts that have kept their color, but most of them are naked. They shielding their groins. Some are embracing each other. Others, quite the opposite, have their arms sticking upwards as if trying to push something away. Their mouths are open in a scream or closed. They are completely white, as if made of frosted glass or ice, as if someone had sprinkled them with flour. In fact, it was lime, the favorite substance of those who shove their victims into mass graves, tried and tested throughout history on all continents. Juliette will show you everything. She closed the first door and opened the next one, the ano then another and another. There are corpses everywhere on display for you to look at them. You can go in among the beds. You just have to be careful not to nudge one of the corpses with your foot. Sometimes there's lifeless hands sticking out of the rugs. But even if you touch it, nothing will happen. There is no need to be afraid. No one's going to tell you to watch out. You can count them. You can take photos of them. You can stay here as long as you like. Maybe at some point it will occur to you that there is a sort of shamelessness in all this, a sort of pornography, wireism, because you've entered to the house of death, although none of them invited you in. You will be wanting to get out of there by now. You don't want to be in the way, but Juliette will invite you to carry on. She'll open the next door, but she won't say anything she'll just be silently insis insisting that we take a look at what's in here. Children. Unlike the adults, they aren't three-dimensional. Their scars aren't round. Mm. Their bodies lie flat, like slices of rolled dough but you can see where their noses used to be and their lips, as if someone had made them from another piece of dough and glued them onto their faces for fun. You can hear those keys jangling again. Now you can see children in uh, the em embrace of their mothers. The babies weren't killed, just their mothers. They went on sucking in the lifeless breast and died of hunger. They were still cuddling up to those breasts now. That April in, April in Murambi, once the killing had stopped, the bulldozers got to work. It wasn't an easy job. The huge pits they excavated were soon full. The bodies barely fitted into them. Then, they were sprinkled in lime and the thin layer of crumbly, sandy earth. A year after the massacre, in accordance with the wishes of the survivors, the grave was reopened with the aim of the reburying the dead under the concrete slabs. 
That was when they discovered that the bodies lying just under the surface were still intact, like dried mushrooms. And that some of the children's desiccated bodies had, had, had been squashed flat under the weight of the adults. 840 mummies were selected and stored in the classrooms. None of us wants to look at them. And a normal person would want to get out of here as soon as possible, leaving Juliette behind without saying goodbye. Let her stay here and guard her dead children. Let her go on standing there like a statue made of stone. Let her go on waiting for me, for you. She is the proud center of, of her Murambi. It isn't mine and it isn't yours, ladies and gentlemen. How nice it is to be aware of that as we sit here discussing the literary use of nostalgia. People sometimes ask me why should we bother with non-fiction? Aren't life's usual difficulties and world's problems enough for us? Wouldn't we be better off distracting ourselves from all that by immersing ourselves in fiction? Not so long ago, I used to answer like this. We live in the belief that we know more and more about the world. But we know less and less. Non-fiction is, cru is, is crucial to us for better knowledge and a better understanding of the world. The mass media aren't going to explain it to us. The commentators usually give us information in pill form, extremely simplified, always removed from the most personal human aspects. But there is nothing we find more interesting than other people and their personal experiences. Nonfiction is about people who are alive or who really did live, not just in someone's imagination, not in a made-up story. Some readers don't want any more made-up stories. There are more and more of us. We haven't the time or the strength, we haven't enough room inside for words that describe someone's fictional life, fictional love, fictional suffering, or fictional dying. There is too much suffering actually happening in reality. I used to say that authors of non-fiction writing about individuals, even if they come from the other end of the world, show how very different we are, and at the same time, how very much we have in common. They allow us to feel close to the people they describe and arouse our empathy. But after 25 years of writing nonfiction, I must confess that it's all nonsense. People from the safe, wealthy part of the world don't want to know what the suffering of poor and persecuted people is like, or what the sinister world is like in close-up. You will say, surely, that it's not true. Aren't there lots of books on topics of that kind? People are very keen to read non-fiction. And I agree. People do want to read books about other people, but on general condition, the fortune they describe cannot interfere with our emotion too strongly. They mustn't disturb our inner mental security too badly. No book should make us feel crushing, crushing helplessness because there are nothing that terrifies a person more than their own helplessness, their own impotence. Non-fiction talks about things that really happened, about the horrific, horrific suffering that people endure in this world, or at least should talk about it. 
not just about trivial things that don't matter. There's always a Bosnia, a Rwanda, a Syria. But what made emerge from this writing, apart from emotion, which isn't worth much? Can writing about the real world change the fate of those who suffer in any way at all? Can writing, writing stop the killing? Can all those poor wretches be saved who board illegal boats in the effort to get into the paradise that is, that is Europe and end up drowning in the Mediterranean? Can it save the Syrians, the Sudanese, the people of the Central African Republic? Can it help the poor in the slums of Manila, Mumbai or Cape Town? Can it be translated into any sort of practical action? Is writing about the wrongs that people inflict on other people all for nothing? As we know, genocide doesn't just suddenly happen. The longer it continues, the more spectacular the after effect. The first stage of this process involves isolating a group of people hostile to us by giving, giving it a name. The second is dehumanization. That's correct. The future victims are called cockroaches, lice or rats that spread typhoid. The future killers have to believe in this so that later on, once they get the signal, they they will purge the world of these insects and vermin eagerly and with conviction. And so we come to the next stage, which is a massacre. And the final stage, eradication. The executioners want us to forget about people they've killed. They want us to wipe them from memory. They want them never to have existed in our memory. That's why Nazis set fire to synagogues and the Serbians under General Radko Mladic blew up the mosques in Bosnia and burned down the national, national library in Sarajevo. And it's why the Interhamwe militia in Rwanda went to the parish registry offices and burn, burned all the population records the only ones in the entire country. So that we all forget about the people they killed. So that we never talk about them, never write about them, and never read about them. The executioners demand our silence. If we keep silent, we are accepting their intentions. The victims expect us to remember them. We should be missing them. That's all that can come out of our writing and reading. If you want to talk about nostalgia for the Tutsi killed 20 years ago in Rwanda, then I'm ready to talk about that. The sort of nostalgia that demands courage from us but with full awareness that the words have already been used, they've all worn out. Thank you.